All right, so for this panel, uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, round. If you guys have some question uh, at the end, you will uh, throw them because nobody wrote them on the, you guys haven't done your homework. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm going to welcome some of those guys here on, on, on the table. So basically, um, tomorrow I'll do a panel with tomorrow's speakers. So today, who I will, um, Ask to come here is, first of all, Mr. Mike Lee. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> and then we have my German teacher, Otwin Gens. <laughs> and then we have my dude, it's only C, guy, Ken Espeslaer. <laughs> Which, by the way, before I go to the next one, Ken and Glenn actually discovered they are from here, from Cologne, originally. Isn't that awesome? There is a very little village, like 17 kilometers from my village, which is called Gut Aschverschlag. And apparently that might be where they're from, so maybe they will stay here. <laughs> the last time that happened with an American, it was with this guy. Uh, all right, and then we need Alex Repti. And then we need a last pack of two with Felix and Oli. So you guys, come a little bit over me, make them a little bit of room. Just let's hug together. So basically there are a few microphones and we share the microphone. So I guess I'm gonna share with Mike, the mic. <laughs> um, did anybody of you guys heard about this old school stuff called Evening at Adler? Probably nobody, which is awesome. Um, back in 2005, um, um, there was a, a, a blogger, which apparently nobody knows what he became, called uh, Drunken Batman. Maybe he was too drunk. Okay. Yeah. You, sorry? He? We know what he became. He became an asshole. Okay. Just like Steve Jobs or another kind of... No, 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 no. The, the bad kind of asshole. Okay. Okay. So, I, I couldn't find a guy, but um, anyways... Um, I find a video which is pretty awesome, and it's funny because it's um, it's uh, so it's called Evening at Adler, so that's why I call this panel Late Afternoon at Alta, um, and uh, it's like Evening at Adler, but just it's not in 2005. All right, um, a lot of those things that they said back in 2005. So I'm going to show some videos, um, which are in a very bit bad, bad quality. Um, uh, interestingly enough, still apply today, seven years later. That's um, very interesting. The first one we're going to start is a little bit of, of this. Um, bit of video, so just watch it this one. DRM is kind of, you know, it's, it's starting to take hold. People are starting to accept it with the iTunes Music Store, now with iTunes Video. I mean, it's really starting to take hold. What will it mean when we go buy a computer 10 years from now if it starts to take hold in other areas like controlling applications and where those can go, where documents can go? So basically, Drunken Batman at that day said, what will it mean when we go buy a computer 10 years from now, it was in 2005, and it will control application as far as where they go and their document can go. Does it remember you something? Sandboxing. Right, that was 2005. So the very first round of question is what do you guys think about this amazing thing called the sandboxing, which some of us love and some not, and then the next question is actually, um, to App Store or not to App Store. I know some of you here are only on the App Store, some others are only not on the App Store or almost only not on the App Store. So who wants to take a try? You know, my feeling is this. As a developer, it irritates me. And as a person who wants absolute freedom in all things, it, it, it troubles me. Um, but as a person who has to deal with, you know, people who aren't super good with computers, like my mom called me up once and she, she would always call me, and I kept telling her, don't call me, email me. And she would always say, I, I can't email you because my computer this and my computer that, and it doesn't work, and I hate it, and I don't like computers, and I don't want any more computers in my house, and I don't like, you know, whatever. And so I told her, Mom, I'm going to buy you an iPad. I'm going to send you this iPad, and it's going to do everything you need it to do. It's going to let you send me email and check your Facebook and keep up with, you know, your grandkids and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you don't have to, you know, she was complaining about getting viruses. She was complaining about, 
you know, she gets her machine and it's great and it's fast and it's performant and it's, and it's functional and then she installs software and it gets slow and it starts behaving in erratic ways. And I told her, you know, the problem is that it used to be that nerds had total access to your computer and they could do anything they wanted and you don't know anything so you couldn't stop them. And so now somebody stands up and they say, no, you can't do this to her. You have to go through us first. And so my mother, who had given up on computers, it went exactly down like that. She uses her iPad. She checks her Facebook. She sends me email. It's the best computer she's ever had. She's still on an iPad 1. She loves it, right? My mother is the customer. I am not the customer. The customer is nothing like me, right? The customer is like my mother. And so from that standpoint, it really made me understand. It really made me feel like... From my standpoint, it's irritating and troubling, but from the standpoint of the customers who I serve, it's the best thing that's ever been invented in the history of computers. How does this relate to Sandbox? sandbox. How does this relate to it Sandbox? It relates everything to Sandbox. That's what we're talking about, right? Sandbox is, is, is the whole notion of the Sandbox and the walled garden, right? Which are connected concepts. Why do we tolerate Sandboxing? We tolerate Sandboxing because it gives our users a secure experience. It locks us out. We are the problem that the users have. It irritates us to be locked out, but it's great for them. It has everything to do with that. Go ahead. Hello. Oh, yeah. So coming from the Mac side, uh, what Apple's trying to do on the sandbox on the Mac is, is make it more like the iPhone and iPad so that users have the freedom to to install apps and not have to worry about them uh, mucking up their system and making them more self-contained. Um, the fantastic thing about the iPhone is that when you delete an app, it's completely gone and it, it didn't have any lasting impact on the system. So you, people have a freedom to try out apps and they don't even know they're installing an app, just buying an app and, and um, they love the fact that that they can do this without affecting the rest of their system and they don't even realize it's happening, but it, it changes the whole uh, process of, of installing applications. Uh, on the Mac, it was more difficult because they're coming at it after apps already existed and I think Apple went up, you know, botched it up a little bit, but when they went to sandbox their own apps for Mountain Lion, that's when they realized they were going to have to do a whole lot more uh, to get things to work. And there were a lot of cool things they showed at WWDC 2012 about what they had added to make their own apps work. Like, you could tell each thing they showed was the result of trying to get one of their own apps to work. Like, you, they showed one thing, and it was clear they'd added that for Keynote, and they showed an another thing that was clear they'd added for Mail. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that's still undocumented uh, which may be useful for sandboxing apps that aren't necessarily even on the App Store, like um, extending extending sandbox permit uh, extending the sandbox to your app with a helper process, like when you um, like the way that uh, when you bring up that open dialog box on the Mac and it, and you pick a file and now you get access to that file, that helper process is granting the privileges back to your app, and there's a whole API there that I've been exploring. Um, so I, the, the things they're adding that's going to make the Mac sandboxing process uh, really cool eventually, mm -hmm. instead of painful as it is now. Yeah, go ahead. I guess that's the, that. <laughs> I guess it's and that's definitely true that uh, as as soon as Apple eats his, uh, his own dog food, uh, basically the developers benefit from that. <clears throat> in my opinion, they should do that a lot more often. Uh, there are numerous examples where Apple basically uses some kind of private APIs or so uh, that aren't made available for developers, and that's always a situation where we definitely complain about the right for them. Um, so um, I, I definitely think it's a good good way, but Apple definitely should should eat its own dog food too, but then. Those are exactly the points that we also do as developers. I figure that if we didn't have sandboxes on iOS apps, 
as we have and have had since the App Store launched, we wouldn't have even remotely the kind of success that we have now. Those kind of sales numbers just wouldn't be possible if we had a market like Android has, where all kinds of crapware exists and people are afraid to download apps and don't pay money for apps because it's all crap anyway. Mm -hmm. It uh, is kind of true for the App Store too. Um, but we wouldn't have that success without the sandbox. But on the other hand, it's not the end all solution for this problem. To make users, that's what Mike said, to make users um, want to try things out, to, to download apps and just play around. Because it kind of limits people, uh, actual people, users, not just us, as well. One situation just had with a Mac app was we needed to import data from different kinds of programs. So I thought, okay, instead of making the user find the files that he can import in the file system, I just use Spotlight, find the appropriate files for them, and just display those files to make it easier for them. To, you know, because the file system is evil and users don't need to see that. But I can't do that anymore. So it's not quite there yet. I, I know it might sound a bit weird, and you guys take the mic as well, right? Now and then. Don't do the shy guys. Um, um, I know it sounds weird, but um, uh, can you imagine how it would have been if back in the days when the iPhone launched, it wasn't based on an app store the way it is, but it would have been based on go on the website and click on this button and install this file? I mean, because you see probably the app store as marketing um, help for some people, but um, I think this is the way it works on some other platforms. And I think we, we still have native apps, but the App Store would be a website instead of a an app. Is that what you mean? No, 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 no. What I mean is it would work the exact same way as it works on the Mac uh, before the Mac App Store. You would go on 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 on, on Ecan's website. I think you'd have what we ha what they have on the Android. Yeah. I mean, I've been told by people that the guy at the Verizon store makes sure that before you leave with your Android that he's installed an app called Task Killer. Which is crucial, apparently, and is the number one downloaded app for Android, which just lets you go and kill processes. So that's kind of terrifying that the top 10 uh, apps on the Android store at one point were all system utilities, whereas there's no such thing as a system utility on the, on the iPhone. I think we'd have the, same, uh, we'd have the same situation, I think. Playing devil's advocate, I'm totally not for click on this button to install an iOS app. All right, the next question is, um, it's actually a, state from, uh, a statement from uh, back in, uh, in the days at uh, evening at Adler. By the way, if you want to watch this whole video, it's like two and a half hours. It's very long, but it's awesome. It's like, for me, it's legendary. And a bunch of legendary developers, and uh, one of those uh, that will be with us tomorrow here. Um, so the next one is writing code is easy, right? Selling this code is harder, so. It's easy to focus on writing code, but it's a heck of a lot harder to focus on getting money. You need to focus on getting cash and taking care of your customers. And being a geek, it was very hard to, you know, to translate from working on the product or working on the website to going out and trying to sign up customers. And if you're going to make it on your own, you've got to have money coming in or you've got to have someone funding you or you have to have a day job. So basically what he was saying is that we are all geeks, we are all programmers, developers. From the moment we have to sell a product, for some of us, it might be a complete other deal. I mean, I think it's more than that. Uh, it's not even about the sales. I, I think that it, it's that writing code is easy, making products is hard, right? Making products, marketing products, I mean, all of the things that you have to do that aren't code, those are the things that make us roll our eyes and sigh. Right? Oh, I have to do something that's not code? Like, what utter bullshit is this? Right? And yet, I would argue that of, you know, I, maybe 10 to 20% of my job as an engineer actually involves writing code. I mean, even the writing code, I spend most of my time searching the code. Right? An order of magnitude less time reading the code. And then every great once in a while do I write the code. I spend a hell of a lot more time thinking about, you know, whether I should write the code than actually writing the code. I think in my way, uh, in my opinion, the, the App Store definitely absolutely revolutionized uh, 
uh, selling selling apps it was never never easier uh, than today to to basically write your your app and put it in front of millions of people basically um, sell without any effort you know, back in the day you needed a staff of people uh, who were doing nothing else than basically uh, negotiating the distribution agreements you had to whatever uh, organize uh, box printing and packaging and CD burning and whatever facilities and it was it was a nightmare actually and then you had to whatever go with that to the Apple store and they took whatever 50 percent of that so um, I think uh, in that regard uh, that is a big revolution that we are seeing here. Um, of course, we as a developer always complain. There are a lot of deficiencies, there are a lot of things that could be better, like customer support is a nightmare in my opinion on the App Store. There's no way to, to, uh, to get in contact with the customer actually. You know, I would like to know, like, from, I would like to reply to whatever and say and, and, and get into dialogue with, with the customer. Issue, that's, issue definitely, refunds. that's definitely something uh, that's totally missing, so we are kind of like uh, the VIP developer who is completely in the background and is completely in, uh, in no connection with the consumer anymore, which is a bad thing. On the other hand, we definitely have to recognize uh, how revolutionary uh, this new distribution process is, and uh, that was just not possible before. So, um, as, as uh, Critic as the much criticism uh, I, I, I voice about whatever things are wrong in the app store, we definitely have to have to recognize uh, that this even created uh, the business for a lot of us that wasn't before available. Um, however, uh, the app stores has uh, back in the early days often been regarded as the marketing saint, just like uh, you know, okay, click submit, get your review, uh, forget about it, and get the cash. But that's not the point of the app store, because you're one in a million out there. Well, not not exact, but about that. So, well, you still you still got your homework to do uh, in terms of marketing, anyway. So, yeah, that that was a bit of a discrepancy between expectations and the real world. That's true, but on the other hand, I mean, that uh, if you remember how it was before, when you had to do all that marketing, you have to do that still. But still, you had, in addition to that, you had to, to do all the distribution stuff, the box printing, the uh, agreements with uh, distributors yeah. uh, all over the world, and, and whatever, talking with key customers who wanted rebates and whatever. It was a nightmare. Yeah, it makes selling apps easier. That's true. But, I mean, you know, it's, course, it's yeah. an argument can be made that it's not much of an app store. It's more of an app warehouse because a store is a place where, like, you go in and the things are on the shelves and you can see them and you try them and buy them, whereas a warehouse is a place where there's just a million things on shelves that go to the ceiling and, and, you, and you can't find anything that you want. But there's a storefront. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like if you've ever been to, you know, to buy Olympia or Land, as it's called now, it's like a massive warehouse, but there's also a storefront. And that's the thing. I mean, the, the biggest problem to me with marketing and discoverability in the app store is that it's the, it's the narrowest store in the world. Right? It, 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 it's like the store is one meter wide and, and, you know, 400 kilometers long because it has millions and millions and millions of products, but when you open the thing up, you only see, like, 10 of them. I think Apple could do a better job of getting exposure. Um, like, when you go to Amazon, it is very smart about what it shows you, what you might like on a personal basis. Um, it doesn't just feature the 10 products that Amazon thinks is cool today. Uh, that wouldn't really work. So. You know what, speaking of the marketing on the App Store, if I might digress, excuse me. Uh, you know, what bothers me is not how the job that Apple's doing. Obviously, there are things that we could suggest that they could do better. What bothers me is that if you talk about marketing strategies for the App Store, right, your best marketing strategy is several orders of magnitude underneath Apple likes you, right? And so, like, if you ask me what is my marketing strategy, my marketing strategy is that Apple likes me. And so my plan is for them to like me, and then I'll be successful, and nothing else really matters. But that's not transmissible, right? That only helps me because I worked there. How do I help you guys, right? Oh, well, I'm going to do it this way because I'm lucky. No, fuck that. That's a terrible thing to say. 
there needs to be a way that you can market on the App Store and be as successful as if Apple liked you without Apple giving a shit about you. That's what I would like to see. And that's not Apple's problem. I think that, that, that that's, you know, that's a much bigger problem. Anybody else want to say something on that? I'll leave a question at the end. I have a wireless microphone for you guys, so think about it. Um, the next one is, can you compete with them? And uh, if, if so, how? And I have a bit from Evening at Adler back in the days as well. Um, by the way, I think every time this is back in the days before the iPhone, it was like Mac OS Tiger or whatever. And a lot of, uh, of, of what they say applies to the iPhone. I worked on, uh, and Royce and I as well, worked on uh, an application called MacAmp long ago, uh, probably about four or five years ago. And it was the first MP3 player for the Mac. Uh, and then SoundJam came out and Audio came out, and then iTunes came out. And uh, we fought iTunes for a little while. Panic fought iTunes for even longer, and we all got slaughtered. There's not much you can do to compete against a free application that ships on every single Mac that's out there. Uh, so as far as an actual, uh, an entire application, like an MP3 player, I think uh, there is a definite concern, uh, I'm not sure for who here, I think we all have fairly innovative applications that Apple can't recreate without it being quite obvious, although perhaps the confabulator guys would have said the same thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think they're worried about the obvious. But uh, so I think there's definitely a concern that Apple will compete uh, as they keep putting out new software. But at the same time, I think the way to stay ahead of it is not to compete directly, but to have a different innovative idea. Uh, so, you know, Apple put out an MP3 player, so we moved on to other audio software. Uh, so I'm going to cut it there because I, I, I thought the argument was pretty interesting. By the way, this is Paul Kafas from Rogami Eva. They, they do a bunch of stuff which has to do with audio. And I think one of the things uh, Paul Kafas was saying there is actually pretty interesting. He said one of the ways to compete against Apple is not to, is to uh, compete in doing innovative products and things Apple doesn't do. So I wanted to have your take on, on fighting, but at the same time not fighting against Apple because, yeah. Um, generally speaking, if Apple has a free application that ships with Mac OS X or with iOS that has the same functionality as your application, you're going to have a bad time. Unless you have a niche product that focuses, or that is, that is very focused on, on a small audience and provides features that those people really need, um, you can basically stop competing with Apple. When, um, years ago we used, to, we used to sell a recorder for uh, iChat video conferencing. And, uh, cool. And uh, it's sort of, it, it's since then turned into the Skype recorder and faded away as iChat video conferencing became less popular. But um, at a certain point in time, Apple added recording to iChat. Um, it didn't really affect the sales of the product because when Apple adds a feature, they don't tend to add a lot of settings or options. There were literally, Apple's idea of adding recording to iChat was adding an item to the video menu that said record. And that was all. And uh, so if you wanted to actually set like the size of the video or where the files go or have it be automatic, etc., you still, uh, our product was still useful. Um, so if, if, if Apple tends to do a very settingless job of things. Yeah, see, that, that's exactly what I mean. You have a product that engages a certain audience those who want more settings, and those happen to be the same people who, who bought it before. And Apple probably only reached the people who never thought about recording their iChat conference before that. So in that case, yeah, it does work. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm supposed to say something about that, because <laughs> since the uh, presentation of iOS 6, um, of course, uh, the fear is, uh, is that Apple Maps app will basically take away my, my business, right? Um, and uh, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a real threat. That's, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, it remains to be seen how it actually turns out. Um, I mean, there are, of course, differences uh, where you can basically separate or, or, or have some, some, some USPs that Apple doesn't have, so, so of course, there will be some um, 
in some ways to compete with them, but it's obviously it's hard. And uh, then the, the other thing, of course, sometimes is it's even harder when Apple has features um, that they just don't make available for you, right? And they basically compete on, on, on two different grounds. Like in this case, uh, Maps have, for example, has features that aren't just in Maps, right? For mm -hmm. the 3D Maps, uh, the, the, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the zoom that you can zoom in very, very deeply or so. There are a lot of uh, things like that, or the QIs that are in Maps. Stuff like that is just not exposed in, in Maps. And, and that, of course, makes sometimes makes things uh, harder to do. Or let's, for example, another example is uh, the routing instructions on the lock screen. Of course, that's awesome. I use it today to, to get the conference here. It's, a, it's an awesome feature. In this case, it doesn't affect me, but for example, all the uh, navigation apps uh, manufacturers like Comcom and Navigon, of course, they would love to have that, but they don't. It's just not possible. It's just not exposed for them. So this is, I think, um, of course, the, the hardest thing when you compete on different grounds, right? And, yeah. But um, that, on the other hand, uh, things like that, you just have to accept them or you, you have to leave the store, right? So it's, it's, it doesn't help you basically to whine about it. Of course, you can try to lobby or, or so, but we all know that lobbying Apple for that is not really um, uh, successful in most cases. So basically, uh, you have to find your way around it and, and, and be innovative and try to find something new, what Apple doesn't have. Because at least there's one thing for granted when they have whatever their production of iOS 6 uh, this month, for example, you have at least one year where you can compete with that yeah. before they introduce a new OS and, and introduce something new that might uh, screw you up, right? So, so basically, the, your only bet or your only chance is basically to be quicker, to be more innovative, and to be yeah, yeah, innovative. To try to to compete with them, even if it's if it's hard, but um, do your best to um, to be smart. I guess I'm gonna let Mike answer, but first of all, I wanted to say I'm gonna move around with the microphone. If anybody has a question, uh, just uh, show your hands. Go ahead, Mike. There's a subtlety here that I think should be pointed out, and it really comes down to how do you compete with Apple versus how do you not compete with Apple. Right? And I think that two model products that you can look at would be Apple Plus and Pair. Right? Apple Plus is basically just an Apple application plus one feature that you think would be cool that they don't have. Right? So basically, Apple releases 1.0 of something and you release 2.0 of that same thing. But the problem is that Apple's going to release that same thing and it's gonna, be, it's gonna be better than you. And there are so many people out there who do this. They see an Apple app, they say, oh, it's missing one feature. And so they make a clone of the Apple app plus the one feature and then when Apple incorporates the feature, they bitch and whine about how Apple just put them out of business. Right? Fuck those lazy assholes. On the other hand, you have Pear. Pear is not Apple. Pear is an entirely other vision to what Apple has produced. Right? I always point out, okay, here's two good examples of that, real fast. iWeb. iWeb came out at the same day that, like, Sandvox came out. And, you know, we talk about being Sherlocked, right? Sherlocked is named after the product Sherlock, which killed off Watson by, you know, Karelia Soft. And then Karelia Soft's like, okay, well then, you know, they killed off our old product, so we're gonna make a new product, Sandvox. And then they released iWeb, like, on the same day, and they were just like, fuck! But where's iWeb now? As far as I know, Sandvox is still going strong. And Sandvox is still going strong because these guys had a vision, they executed on that vision, and they did, they said, you yeah, know, forget it. There's nothing we can do, ignore Apple. Let's do our own thing. Let's make this product the best thing that we can possibly do. Let's make a web editor that satisfies our vision for what a web editor should be. And that's how you can be successful. By the way, Dan Wood is uh, one of the two guys, and Terence is the other guys from Karelia. And do uh, you have a question, anybody? Okay, I thought. Um, you also have to consider that Apple doesn't technically allow apps into the App Store that that does what their apps do, right? So in theory, if you tried okay. to write a better MP3 player, they would just reject it. That's theory, of course. Huh? Yeah. I mean, the, this is, of course, something that's also hard to compete with. I imagine the podcast apps was uh, yeah. rejected for duplicate functionality for a, lot of time, for a long time. And then the first uh, podcasting apps uh, spread uh, spread out and it worked, right? And yeah. it were, they were accepted. But basically, you just have to try it, even with the highest of reject rejection. This is, of course, also like a little bit like gambling, but you 
that hand through it for all of you. All right. Um, if anybody has a question, just jump. Or if you have your own question, just think about this because I'm entering the last bit of, uh, of this talk after that other need. Because it was faster than I thought. Okay, this is the square bracket gang. If anybody knows, uh, don't, doesn't know what it is. That's from C4, I think, back in the days. One of the uh, uh, conference that uh, brings us inspiration for the We have the dot syntax now. Yeah. By the way, is there anybody, because I figured out yesterday, uh, speaking of, uh, I was going to say apropos, the German or the French, that sounds right. Is there anybody in the room here who doesn't get the, the objective coloring logo? Probably some of you. Because those who understand, it's, it's fine, but you don't understand, right? Do you, do you know what this is? Those things here? Carrots, right? Yeah. But not only carrots. Because there's no such thing as a double block. I mean, you could probably program a double block. But um, the, the Cologne Cathedral, they're not doing right? Yeah. It's one of those things where you are a developer and, uh, and you do something really cool and you think like, yeah, and then nobody gets it. <laughs> you got it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was happy that at least you got it. Yeah. I've been to Cologne before, so I know that everybody yeah. draws it like that. Yeah. Uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll have him tomorrow as a speaker, but uh, thanks to Martin Winter for all the nice logo thingies and everything, which, is, which looks nice. It's from him. Right? <laughs> well, then again, if it looks ugly, it's from me, all right? <laughs> so, so you know, that's my trademark. Um, all right. Objective C is also pretty much a dead end. And, you know, it, it hurts me to say that, but. You know, from what I can tell, it is. Um, I think so, I've been hearing that for about 12 years now. Yeah. You know, I knew I would get flack for that. So, yeah. and that's why I threw it out there. That way everyone can yell at me. But, you know, I, I, I don't see a few. You're next off this island. Would, no, would no, you no. elaborate on that one? <laughs> would you elaborate on that, Wolf? Oh, uh, we'll elaborate on what? Objective-C objective being a dead end. Um, if, you, if you can effectively pull pointers out of Objective-C, uh, it may not be a dead end, but to my knowledge, that's been thought uh, impossible. Uh, okay, uh, I, I can yield the floor. <laughs> no, 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 no. Some, I, some, it's like people are just kind of lined enough to go ahead. And take <laughs> I, I on. I, um, it's very interesting because this guy, for those of you who don't know, that's Ralph French, and it's one of the oldest uh, Mac programmer and well known in the community. And back in 2005, Walt French goes and say, Objective C is pretty much of a dead, dead hand. And obviously, all the guys around him, among those two guys from Apple, uh, go like, oh! Especially if you, if you watch the video, look at the, look at the face of those shitties. Uh, it's pretty interesting. And uh, one of the reasons is, uh, he, he says, and yeah, because it's pointer based, blah, 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 blah. And um, what's, what's, uh, what's interesting is that we're in 2005, Objective-C back at that time was not that successful besides the Mac guys. And then it went today, actually a few days ago, it uh, became the third language, uh, most successful language in the world, just after, what is it, C and Java. So it's actually more used than C++ now. Um, yeah, which is really, it's, it's awesome. I have another video, and then we're gonna speak about that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and by the way, the, one of the reasons why I ask this question is because this is called Objective Cologne, right? It's not called whatever, blah blah blah, Coco. It's uh, because it's it's Coco, obviously, but it's also the level of the language in itself, Objective C. Now let's go to the uh, next one. Every couple of years, people are like, "Well, we need a high-level language that's gonna get rid of." pointers and, and they, they introduce it and, and then C wins out again. And it's just been, it's just amazing uh, how regularly it's been uh, since, you know, the invention of C where it was like, oh, uh, Modula 2, no, first Pascal, then Modula 2, then the, the four GLs were coming, uh, then Ada was the standard. Um, and then, you know, we had all the things from Microsoft and other vendor solutions and then Java was going to kill it. And every time people go, wait, this sucks, we can't do any real work. Let's go back to language where we can just write it, it works, we're done. And uh, so I, I would, I, my feeling is, is, is that this, this, this miracle language isn't coming. I, I, Do you think there's more languages, more software being written today in C? I mean, percentage-wise. Do you think 
C and C++ and Objective-C that, in terms of uh, market share, for lack of a better word, do you think that, you know, nine... I'm going to cut on this one because Wolf goes over on a, on a very, uh, yeah, detailed uh, question. But basically what Will Shipley um, uh, from Delicious Library and from Omni Group and uh, Mike work with him um, is, is saying is that um, every so and so years somebody comes and say Objective-C, oh, that old shit, it's dead. And we're still there, we're number three, which is kind of weird. To tell you the truth, when I started with Objective-C, I was like, well, that, well, like a lot of us, well, that's weird, that's old, and that's blah, blah, blah. But so the next question is actually, why do you guys love this language, and why some of you, when watching a JavaScript, for example, go, oh, no, I'd rather have Objective-C. Um. I know they're not exactly label parameters, they're part of the method name, but yeah, label parameters. It's, it goes to the point where I can't even read Java or C code anymore, because there's like five parameters to a function or method, and I can't remember the order in which they are. And in Objective-C, it's just so easy to read. You don't have to constantly think about the API that you're using, it's just one nice flow and makes well-written programs, very easy to read, and I just love that. Going beyond the language, part of the language, which I think I could take or leave, what makes programming in Objective-C on uh, iOS and on Mac OS so powerful to me is Apple's uh, foundation frameworks and the, the work they've put into making it development fast. Um, Usually, a sort of frameworks go along with the language. If you looked at Java, um, C plus plus didn't bring much to, to the table as far as useful frameworks. But just the fact that uh, foundation goes along with Objective C almost inseparably, and to me, that's part of the language. You know, how you work with strings and how you work with data structures. And uh, to me, that's what's powerful about the language is how fast we can you know, make a dictionary and iterate through it and how they're continuously making it easier for us with the advances that they talk about each year um, is what I like about it. Yeah, I think absolutely the, the, the framework is absolutely the, one of the, the key things and adding to that perhaps I think that's made possible because of the dynamicality of the, the, the runtime and all the, the runtime basically uh, yeah, allows us to do that many uh, things like dynamically, uh, whatever loading uh, stuff or so. That definitely, I think, sets Objective C and, and Cocoa apart from, from, from other development frameworks. To me, there is something very important actually, which hasn't been mentioned yet. This video is 2005, and it sounded like Objective C was about to die. And then came a few things Objective C 2.0 with a few cool things like dot notation, which helped a lot of people, really, just to, because I, when I teach um, Objective-C and Cuckoo, I used to say, I still say it, that learning Objective-C and Cuckoo is not a learning curve, it is a learning wall. It's like you meet the wall. There's no way you can learn it the smooth way. There's no smooth way. There's no easy way to learn Objective-C and Cuckoo. It, there is a hard way, and, and either you survive it, or you die in flame. Um, I teach iOS, I can tell you, some students die in flames. And two of my students are here, they, they survived. Um, um, and, uh, but the other thing is, uh, then came 2007, the iPhone, and Apple chose to use Objective-C and Cocoa and all the regular stuff for the iPhone. And without that, really, I don't know if Objective-C today would be the number three language in the world. Probably not. Without the iPhone? Yeah. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. There is, uh, the iPhone brought so many new people to, to Objective-C, to Coco and Foundation that without those people, there nearly wouldn't be as much Objective-C as there today. Um, I re remember the, the WWDC talks, uh, iOS programming for Mac programmers. I think the year after that, it reversed. <laughs> so yeah, it was, so uh, that already explains yeah. uh, how much uh, what, what I remember. Human capital to the platform. But look, look at the contracting offers you receive nowadays. There is very few Mac offers anywhere in there. It's mostly iOS. What I remember is the first year of the iOS 
SDK at WWDC, seeing how many guys in the audience were taking notes on Windows laptops and just thinking, oh my goodness. First of all, what are you doing on taking notes anyway, Windows guy? Just, just, just smile and leave him be because in, you know he's never going to be as good as you. So if, if you're not in it for the All platform, those people had to get Macs in order yeah, to do and it. And they probably hate it. And they probably, well, they, they, if you come in with the, with the idea that this is just a tool that you have to use because your boss forced you to, you're going to hate it as good as it is. They're probably still using Windows machines at home or their mindset switched a little. And now they get it, and they actually get the platform, and they can actually produce great apps. But I think this is not the usual case. I think case. there are still those Windows guys around there, but they just are too slow to attend that PC. Um, are you talking uh, about uh, Adobe uh, developers? <laughs> Adobe developers? I, I was going to say this isn't a Windows conference, right? So not any names. Uh, yeah. Please stop with Windows. And <laughs> actually, Zeno has a question, I think, or a remark, or whatever. You can just speak yeah, in the I, mic if it works. Uh, it does. Yeah. All right. So, uh, but don't you guys think that the fact that the Apple had the balls to make the Objective 2.0, which changed a lot of things in the language and the runtime and everything, don't you think that the fact that the language is still evolving beyond the framework, it, it, it's something that matters, right? Objective C is the most living language that I know of. It, it, it absolutely is, and Objective 2.0, that's what it was all about. It was all about this idea of, wait, who says that computer languages have to be frozen, right? They absolutely don't. And, and this gets back to what I love about Objective-C more than anything, is that it is the most pragmatic programming language in the world. Every programming language other than Objective-C is built with some, some ideal in mind. Right? Either an ideal about performance and the machine, or an ideal about the way the language should be designed. Objective-C eschews ideals. Objective-C is all about getting things done pragmatically. That's why we have categories. That's why we have runtime.h. Because at the end of the day, Objective-C is good for whatever. And that's why it's such an awesome language. They'll add things to the language. Like, oh, we added literal types just because we were sick of yeah, you hate it, we hate it too. Literal types, there you go. It only took us 20 years of asking for it. Yeah, I remember... Like you said, it's only there because it lets you get your work done faster. It's not there because of any kind of principle of how it should work. It's, we got sick of writing NS number, number with it. I mean, one, of, one of the most pleasurable experiences that I had at Apple was watching Steve Jobs shut down somebody who wanted to argue something on principle. If anybody has a question, it's now or never because it's uh, kind of public time, all right? Um, can you go over there? Um, and then I will have another a last question for you guys, for each and every single of you. Actually, before you ask the question, I'm going to uh, ask them the question so they can think about the answer. Because the last thing I'm going to ask you guys, and so be, it's also because I want to you to each and every single of you to as, uh, speak, is um, the question is, um, why do you do this stuff on iOS and macOS? What, why are you on this platform? What makes you not being whatever, a Windows developer or a, a web developer? Or, I mean, in your case, Guy, you understand what I mean. It's the platform. You guys are only localizing iOS and, and, um, and macOS. You could localize uh, whatever, a website and Java apps and whatever. So go ahead, Carlton. Um, I've seen in 10 years or so, I've been using Macs and a few years developing iOS applications. I've seen Apple go from underdog to you know, world domination. And when I started using the Mac, Microsoft was the great evil, and they were in a position of world domination. So I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on Apple's dominant position? Are you worried and that kind of, you know, about that position? I worry mostly about the public perception of Apple as a company. Uh, you know, Apple has always benefited greatly from having a strong benefit of the doubt from its consumers. And that's no longer true. And if anything, we're seeing Apple starting to suffer from what Microsoft long suffered from, which is an opposite of the benefit of the doubt, where people are instantly suspicious of everything that Apple does. So now, you know, Apple releases something, and, and they have to worry about people who are accusing them of what it could mean, and, and this is their sinister motive, and that's their sinister motive. And the thing is, 
the Apple, the guys at Apple, they just don't think that way. That's not what they're thinking about. And so that whole thing becomes an enormous distraction to the company and an enormous distraction to the people at the company. Um, you know, and, and I hate to see them losing that advantage. And it causes confusion, confusion amongst customers who, who basically just read uh, generic newspapers that are, in, in most cases, misinformed, right? Yeah, that's kind of unfortunate. Ooh. We have another question. I love this place because it's super easy to walk around the place. So, it was briefly mentioned before, the dot syntax introduced in 2.0, um, which, as far as I can see, is a very debated thing on whether or not the dot syntax is a good thing or a bad thing. So, uh, the big neurotransposition, which I'm siding with now, is that basically the dot syntax obscures the fact that you're doing method calls with all their effects and uh, results. Uh, so, like, you're now doing a method call instead of accessing a properly of struct, which is a whole different game. What is your view on, on this approach? Uh, I would say I would say that uh, sorry <laughs> I would say that uh, of course you're right it's 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 unfortunate that uh, they chose the same character for for the struct uh, as for the property uh, accessor ba basically um, that's that's definitely um, a valid valid critique in my in my opinion on the other hand um, especially if you if you chain a lot of uh, op property Property operations basically it makes code so much better readable. Uh, as with the, the square brackets end up with, uh, with whatever five brackets opening, and have no clue what that code actually means, right? Whereas with uh, dot syntax, it's pretty clear what it does. So, so I think I'm pr pragmatic in, in that regard that I love it because of the clarity. But of course, it's right. You have to be aware of what is what is what is uh, actually done behind the scenes, right? And, and that kind of is to, to new programmers. I can imagine that it's, it's sometimes or might be confusing uh, at times. Um, my take on this is that um, I think it's great that we use dot syntax, and I even think it's okay that we use the same characters for accessing structs. Because all of the, all of that is an implementation detail that I shouldn't have to worry about. But it's not. But it absolutely it's... fucking is. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> look. Look. Listen. Seriously. I do not understand this argument. It makes no fucking sense Let to me. me. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> you know how I program a computer? I put my face close to the microprocessor and I whistle at it. And that causes there to be a differential in the voltages across the wires because that's the only thing that's real. The ones and zeros mask you from that. Fuck ones and zeros. C, assembler, oh my god. Do you know all of the pain that assembler is hiding you from? Do you know the implementation details that C is hiding you from? And so now you're going to tell me that this is a step too far? That is such utter bullshit. <laughs> it makes no What? fucking sense. Yeah. Oh, let me give a like, let me yeah. give a very, very easy yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, you wanna you wanna set the fr you wanna move a view. You wanna move a view uh, 100 pixels to the right. What you want to do is like uh, view dot frame dot or origin dot x plus zero uh, view dot, 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 right? view dot, dot view dot center view dot center view dot frame is not a reliable plus value. Equal 100 doesn't work either. And that's uh, that's the that's I, I think uh, in this case there's this is a classic example where it's not implementation detail anymore. But, but everything really everything is always it, like that because something like that every just layer work, every right? layer of abstraction. Like seriously, I know one of the guys who works at Apple. He's a super low level guy, and the reason why he refuses to program in anything higher than C and hates getting into C is because he paid for every goddamn bit of that RAM, and he'll be damned if he's not going to be able to access every single bit. But he can't. He can only access pages at the high level. And then he gets down and they only want him to access lines or bytes? You're going to limit me to bytes? Fuck that. Every level of abstraction costs you something like that. It's no, not worth throwing I'm, the baby I'm, out I'm with the bathwater. Uh, I'm definitely not debating on whatever performance or, or memory considerations. It's just about the, basically it's, it suggests that you could write this, but it doesn't work in this way because you, you just cannot increment the property, right? Worth or, it. Uh, 
Either ways, I found my tagline for Objective Cologne 2013. Fuck ones and zeros. <laughs> I think it's an amazing tagline. Now you will understand why I didn't organize a sumo fight tonight. <laughs> because it's dangerous with my... Okay, I would lose the sumo fight. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Anybody who has seen those sumo videos from NS Conference, otherwise Google for it, it's pretty funny, actually. Um, all right, the question, because I want to hear uh, Felix. You haven't said a word. So start, you start and explain me your love for iOS and macOS. Yeah, that's right. Shame on me, I didn't say it. Um, the reason why, why I really like the platform and we're working on it um, is that, from my opinion, um, when I started to use the Mac, I was really, I was really, um, it was a new world for me because I could use a computer to achieve a goal or, or to, to perform a task and I didn't have to spend half the day to make the computer work. And uh, Today I see a, a bit of two levels of applications on the Mac and on iOS, which are very quality driven, very, very, with, with a nice UI and nice concepts, and there's crap. But uh, as I have the choice to use what I want, I'm happy that there is this quality layer and there are people around really looking for quality work and um, appreciate if you um, if you do quality work with, which then costs more money than doing crap. So, um, apart from, from the money making, um, part of the business is like, um, I think everybody around here really likes to get appreciation for good work. And the Mac and the iOS and the, the development community for us is a community uh, who appreciates good work. So this makes working on it very enjoyable. That's why I do Awesome answer. I'm going to ask all the other guys to make it a little bit shorter, but he was allowed to make it longer because it's supposed to be on the side. Um, give it to Felix. So. Uh, to, sorry, um, Oli. Um, yeah, whatever. Oli, you want to add something to that? Well, there's not much to add, but basically um, what I love about uh, Mac and, and iOS is uh, that it's a superior system in terms of uh, what it enables the user to do. And what it doesn't show to the user because he doesn't need to to know this kind of stuff and uh, I think that's that's what makes working on a Mac with a Mac with Mac applications and all this stuff very enjoyable uh, because because you you see the beauty of it that's basically it. Okay. Alex um, well basically. I come from a background of mixed operating systems. I used everything from DOS to Windows to, uh, what was that IBM thing? OS2. Warp. OS2 Warp. OS2 Warp. BOS. Uh, different Linux flavors and uh, BSD flavors. And uh, at one point, a friend of mine came and said, look, I got this iBook. It's really neat. And it's practically BSD with a usable user interface. And I said, get out. I can't believe that's true. <laughs> Well, he got a new one, and he lent me his old iBook. So I, I played around for two weeks on his old iBook, and uh, since I've always been into into programming, ever since I was six or so, I got my Commodore 64. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the gang. Yeah. Uh, I opened up, I think it was Project Builder at that time. I opened up Project Builder. I hated it with a passion, but um, there was the Java Cocoa scripting bridge, because Objective-C put me, put me off at first. I didn't like it. Yeah. Um, I used Java Cocoa to write some applications and I figured out, wow, that's fucking easy compared to everything I've ever seen before in terms of writing UI. And I think since that day I've only booted a Windows computer to play a game that wasn't available on iOS. And I don't even do that anymore. So, never look back. Yeah. You guys are on the Mac forever, right? Uh, yeah, uh, my first computer was a Mac I see. So I, I, I you really do not have a lot of Windows experience. I, I, I left. It's okay. It's I, okay. I, it's okay. We're, we're fine with it. I left my last full time job because they were making me do Windows stuff. Um, but, um, the thing that I love about being in, just in the Apple, uh, universe is that, uh, they're constantly improving their products massively every six months. So you always feel like you're on the, you know, you're, it's not stagnant. You're on the cutting edge. You, every time I buy a new laptop, it's like every year, it's a million times. 
I've, my primary computer's been a laptop what since did, what 19, did you say? 1999. So. Oh, Mac Pro. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, you can still put Mountain Lion on it. So, um, yeah, my, my primary computer's been a laptop since 1999 when I bought the blue iBook, the blue toilet seat iBook. And I've had one every year or so since then. And every time they, they take out the old crap and they put in the new. And my new machine is missing so many things that I'll never miss. And is such an amazing device that that's why I like to be here is that, that I get to play with the latest and greatest stuff and I don't have to, to, uh, uh, use the old stuff. All right. Let's, thank you. Uh, let's do the auto. I, I admit, uh, I not always use the Mac. I had a Commodore 28.4, which was just a Commodore, was on run which was just a Commodore 64 for rich people. Uh, no, it has a, it has a, it had a different, it had a second processor which was awesome. Yeah, which nobody used, yeah, right? You, you started, you started with the Commodore key to emulate 64. No, 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 no Yeah, you had, you had to go into 64 gamer, mode actually. for everything. Oh, you was never a gamer. I, I was never a gamer. That helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but then since then basically I think the, the first Mac was an LC so I'm kind of uh, long on the platform um, even though I think there were hard years like uh, the Mac OS eight years or so they were kind of uh, hard years like, where your Mac crashed at least twice a day I think <laughs> so I resorted to do a lot of stuff on the server side on a Linux machine or so because it was just much more stable. And then, of course, when Apple uh, switched to a Unix system, it was great, because they basically had the same thing, basically, that I used for years on the server side, also on my, yeah. my work machine, right? That was awesome. And, uh, and then, of course, I never looked back. And I, right now, what I definitely think, um, the reason why I'm, I'm not doing any Android or Windows or whatever development is, I think because I love the product, and I couldn't, I couldn't never imagine basically writing code, writing software for a system I won't use every day. That's ultimately uh, the result will be crap. I love the word product. It goes back to the beginning of the day with Mike. Great products. Yeah, I mean, all of the things you guys said, totally true, and you, I, I could say that same thing for myself as well. Right, absolutely. I mean, I love the company, I love the people there, I love the community, all of you guys, but there are a lot of things that I love that I don't make a career out of. Uh, you know, simply put, it's the platform that sucks the least right now. And it has been the platform yeah. that sucks the least for quite some time, but the day that it's not the platform that sucks the least, we all owe it to ourselves to leave. Because we love this company for making great products, not for any other reason. And as soon as those products are no longer the least sucky products on the market, then they're no longer the company that we love. Fair enough. All right. Um, before you give them a round of applause, before, um, we are going to leave this place. You guys are going to leave this place uh, for today. And we will be back tomorrow at around uh, 9. Be here tomorrow at 8.39. Be at 9 here. Um, and um, so where we go in an hour, it's actually 600 meters away. If you look on the website, uh, it's Bonnerstrasse 242. Uh, so whatever you do during the next hour, uh, maybe you can stay in this green area there and, and do a sitting and cobble together. I don't know. Um, it's actually pretty easy to reach. And if you look at on, on, on Street View, that's exactly how it looks. There's a big panel saying, oh, 242. So uh, basically, that's it's not short for David Hasselhoff. Um, yeah, and, and this is inside. So you go inside, and this is inside, and I should be there normally if all goes well with this banner, and you should find us. That's pretty much it for today. Give them a round of applause into yourself as well. Thank you very much. See you later.